Okay, good. So, American International College, if just do a little verbal lead step here, American International College, March 3rd, 2017, uh, brown bag lunch. This is the Kima, Historical European Martial Arts and the Historiography of Imagined Whiteness. I apologize for the presenter view, but the way the projector works is actually showing that screen as the projections is really the only way to do it. So if you don't know, uh, HEMA stands for Historical European Martial Arts. Um, one of my fields of study, um, much, like, um, much like music, which Karen studies, it's interesting because we're taking the written records of something that's essentially performative, that is fencing, and we're looking at how it <coughs> was put into practice and what this in turn says about the society, both the idiom it's written in, how it's written in, what these sources are, and why. But what I'm interested in for purposes of this talk is how the study, which has been pretty much neglected by academic historians, has been picked up by an amateur fan base, and in turn has, um, they've sort of taken this narrative and they, they run with it and how they and run with it into some, in some cases, some pretty disturbing places. And the way that the, in, in a sense that the academy has sort of advocated its responsibility to have uh, an authoritative discourse or, or counter discourse, at least in this field, but I would say in medieval history in general, which has allowed medieval history to be picked up and used for right-wing ends in, or I should say all right wing ends, right? Not necessarily traditional conservatism, but certainly uh, virulent, uh, certain particularly virulent, virulent xenophobic, nationalistic, um, uh, nationalistic form of right-wing nationalism that has not really um, been precedented. And much like the Civil War has been used that way by Confederate apologists, the um, the, the, uh, and there, there's at least a counter discourse there where people say it's not about states' rights, it's about slavery, right? Well, here we've got a case where we have, uh, you know, something that's seen as very niche in the United States, uh, perhaps less so in Europe, but it's been hijacked everything from, you know, Marine Le Pen appearing in front of, um, in front of uh, statues of, of Joan of Arc to, you know, people spray painting, uh, you know, Deus Vault on the mosques, but we'll get into that in a moment. So just to begin, let's see if I can. There we go. So medieval history it should be no surprise to anyone that medieval history, or rather, I should say medievalism, the idea of the Middle Ages, the, the pop culture deployment of the Middle Ages, has been very, very hot lately. Um, there's medievalist video games, uh, Game of Thrones on TV, the Lord of the Rings movies, uh, Renaissance fairs, reenactment groups, live action role playing. Um, all these things um, play on this medievalist, medievalist themes, and it's become a huge part of uh, pop culture, not to mention extremely lucrative. Um, and the whole European martial arts movement, the HEMA movement, is no less a part of the zeitgeist than um, any of these other parts. Um, so HEMA is, briefly, um, the study of sources of personal combat from ancient, medieval, early modern, and modern Europe, um, and the academic study, of course, bleeds over into physical study, which is one reason why this is seen as kind of fringy, perhaps, by academia. Um, but it's also why I'm a fencing coach and a fencing master, in addition to being a college professor. Um, and there's a number of um, academics, young academics working in this field, um, Daniel uh other people such as that, uh, mostly in Europe, a few people up and coming in grad school these days, where they're, you know, they find they're more successful in finding jobs than I have is up to debate. But, uh, and there's also one dedicated journal, active periodically to reform. But of course, it's not like there are any endowed chairs of this sort of thing, whereas you can do, you know, find chairs in medieval musicology and professorships and musicology and other things like that. Um, so it's an emergency field, it's an, sorry, an emerging field, and it's one that's really dominated by popular and not academic discourse. In some cases, you know, horribly, horribly um, strange things. Uh, when one Facebook conversation yesterday, someone was uh, speculating that a particular fencing book was uh, composed by Hidden Knights Templar and things like that. So, 
this is, uh, you know, you, you start getting really, uh, really, really fringy and strange things in this. So, but that sort of observation really holds true for the Middle Ages and the Renaissance as a whole because medieval history is a troublesome and a rather niche subject in Anglophone academia. I mean, really, I would say most, most academia. Um, I'm not sure. It's probably better, of course, in the UK, but, you know, the Australians don't care, the Canadians don't care so much, uh, perhaps a little bit more than the Americans do, certainly in America we don't care. And of course the reason why is no surprise to anyone, because the audience we professional historians are aiming at is not the public, but one another, right? The academic monograph is a niche thing. It's something that's only bought by academic libraries, when we can buy them ourselves, we get the library to buy them. Um, and this is the way we're trained in graduate school, that, you know, that anything popularizing or populist is sort of basing what we do. And popular interest does not create any more tenure-track jobs, which is, you know, uh, it are about as rare as hen's teeth. Um, if anything, popular interest might be an argument against things, right? And unlike our colleagues in the vocational programs, the nursing program here, the the PT program, the OT program, right? The hard sciences or business and law schools, we do not create wealth, we do not wield power, we do not yield influence, right? We have brought nothing to the table except, uh, except that we had better be, you know, interesting dinner guests and help clean up afterwards, right? Um, our job as historians is that we produce socially useful troops. That is the, if you want to look at you know, sort of the tripartite structure of society, as I always tell my undergrad classes, right? You've got those who rule, in our case, it's the guys on Wall Street, you know, you've got those who work, it's what we're training our students to be. And then there are those who justify and the job of the historian, you know, whether the descendant of the medieval clergy, our job is to justify the, the power regime, right? The eternal truths of, the, you know, democracy, capitalism, the nation state, all these things, right? But today, of course, um, our socially useful Truths are uh, justifying the increasingly, increasingly diverse, multicultural, interconnected world. That's why we have, you know, a world civilization course here instead of Western civilization. We got rid of Western civilization, I believe, some years ago before I ever arrived, and now it's okay. Can go teach world civilization, world civilization one, which is truly a course about nothing, because uh, because you know there's no world civilization before 1500. It's ridiculous, but it, 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 the, the course of the meta thing about the world civilization course, of course, is that it's not about, you know, the history of the world, it's about, you know, you know, all cultures are great and valuable, kumbaya, let's all hold hands, right? And that's exactly what any global history textbook you know, sounds like, which is why I really despise using them. Um, so, Europe, right, that basically, and this is, this is driven by needs in society, right, global business knows no boundaries, the middle class is not reproducing it. Uh, reproduction rate that we need, uh, people on H-1B visas to come here and do, you know, and do skilled jobs, and xenophobia and nationalism is not good for the bottom line, right, and of course people who are left behind by these facts are, become the core of Trump voters, right, this is the political reality of our time. So, we, though, as the historians, right, existing in our liberal elite bubble, right, we've all been through grad school, we're all professional historians, though, we have a certain narrative, we're putting forth that narrative, and if you want to make it in medieval history or any other field of history, then you've got to, uh, then you, you've got to justify this. I'm saying this, of course, more for the YouTube audience than you guys, because I've already told you everyone this, basically, over years at one point or another, right? So, my grandmother, right, she, Taught, you know, she taught American history in high school, and she, to her dying day, declared that the founding fathers were, you know, divinely inspired. Today, you teach a critical history of the United States, and, you know, cre you know, critique this narrative. Thomas Jefferson was a slave owner. We learn about Thomas Jefferson, but what about Sally Hemings, etc., etc., etc. Right? Um, so, the reason why we do this, of course, is that we are praising. We're telling the kids this is the why, the reason why things are and this is what you should accept, right? Uh, next slide. Right? So that's part of the reason why medieval history is so damn problematic, right? It's the history of dead white males. And it's the origin of the modern imperialistic states without even being able to bring in imperialism to have a critique of that. Um, 
it's definitely, definitely troublesome. So, the you know, the, you know, but there's still that older narrative too. The middle, the middle ages as sort of the other, right? This sort of nineteenth century idea of the middle ages as a more primitive time. The middle ages as a uh, a, a harsher time, you know, a, 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 a time of you know, a Frazetta painting with you know barbarians with two-handed swords and, and women in chainmail bikinis, right? There's that still that kind of older, older, uh, older version. Also, the idea of the Middle Ages as a time of the rise of European nations, this sort of idea of the autocathonic European nation that is, you know, comes sui generis from the people, Clovis was the first king of France, et cetera, et cetera. We still find this in French historiography today. Um, so there's still these older uses of history in medieval history, right? So in this uh, scholarly ecosystem where, where diversity, inclusion, and internationalism are a leitmotifs, and scholars tailor their research subjects to these needs, the stigma is only more pronounced. No matter how popular that medieval history may be outside the ivory shower, it still remains deeply unfashionable in academic circles. And it's still seen by the profession at large as the progress-free zone before history began. Uh, this is Rachel Fulton Brown, uh, a friend of mine at um, University of Chicago. Unlike me, she has a real job and tenure. Um, and she describes herself as an entish Presbyterian medievalist. She's also a foil cleanser. Um, and she, she was uh, excoriated a couple of years ago for her blog post, Three Cheers for White Men. Basically, she says, uh, medieval men invented the idea of consent with courtly love, um, and that, and that uh, the idea that maybe feminism and not and non-rape culture were good ideas. And this was immediately jumped upon by commenters and else, elsewise uh, as uh, an apology for Eurocentrism and historically dubious. So um, thankfully, she has a free speech pass, so she has tenure, but I regress. <laughs> so if medieval history is problematic, and yes, that is me in college, um, is problematic than neo-medievalism, uh, medievalism reflected itself back on itself through the funhouse mirror of uh, pop culture profit movies, more so, right? So I'll give you an, an example. So I went to the University of Buffalo as an undergraduate, and my coaching professor, Carly Delight, who had been active in the black arts movement, um, I told her I was into the SCA, and she said, why are you into that white stuff? Because she had this idea, coming from her Afrocentric perspective, that I should be interested in my authentic Jewish culture, which of course, I suppose, would have precluded me studying at a, a public university and, you know, or associating with, you know, women or things like that, but whatever, right? Um, so she, you know, she can't, so that, that was, but that was a certain perspective. I think she's not wrong in maintaining that perspective because she came from a certain time and place. But she said, you know, what are you doing that for? What the hell is the political re relevance of that? She was right, right? And obviously, as you can see, I learned a thing uh, in all this intervening time. So. There's good reason, though, for playing at the Middle Ages to be politically suspect. Uh, Victoria Cooper, she was then a PhD student at Leeds, summed the problem, problem up uh, a couple years ago at uh, Kalamazoo, the big medieval conference of Kalamazoo, with a paper on um, exploring nationalism in, and conservatism in fantasy video games. She said, and she was, you know, this got picked up, uh, this got put on medievalist.net and put on the blogosphere, and she was like receiving death threats and rape threats for this, but that. Um, the medieval imagery and the idea of authentic national culture could easily be turned to serve right-wing anti-immigrant political ends. The Middle Ages are, in Cooper's words, imagined as gritty, white, male, and powerful. To her, medievally themed video games are a space in which whiteness can be anchored in a happy history where a world is free of multiculturalism and white guilt. So in other words, we're celebrating European culture, and that fact itself is suspect. Right, suspect in today's academy. Right, um, so Cooper's talking about sort of implicit Eurocentrism in this material, but you can see this happening pretty explicitly in things like um, Militia de Wall. That's not her. That's a painting, but Militia, Militia de Wall, who runs the uh, Tumblr um, People of Color European Art History, um, looking at premodern depictions of uh, uh, African Asian people in European art, um, has received all sorts of threats. Right. Uh, um, you know, harassment, death threats, rape threats, all those sorts of things by people of one persuasion or another. There's obviously some group of people out there who are offended by this. 
Um, which means, so having kind of given this background, I come coming in sort of a roundabout way to the study of historical European martial arts. Um, this, the fact that this, uh, you know, that, that I, my chosen field to study of all people's swords is really, really, really interesting. But uh, it sort of makes me sort of weird in an academic sense. But amongst non-academics, my, you can see the audience by the stats here on um, myacademia.edu. Here's a paper I wrote on the history of Italian fencing. And here I, had, I put these up on the same day, by the way. 188 views, 20 on my paper on, um, uh, a better paper, I think, on, uh, on um, uh, multilingualism on the medieval frontier, which I thought was a really good paper, actually. Um, so both of them published in peer, you know, book chapters published in peer reviewed books by Brill, same sort of, oh no, sorry, I think the other was De Gruyter, but whatever, you know, totally academic stuff. I posted both of them on my Facebook at the same time. Maybe it's, you know, telling who are my Facebook friends, but people are way, way more into reading about fencing than they are about multiculturalism and multilingualism and feminist theory. Um, and in fact, I would say that there are people in this community, um, and I'll call it a community, which formed online, there's a whole history behind it, which I'll get a little bit into in a bit, but they are downright disparaging of academics. This is, so um, basically, I, I posted the, uh, a call for papers for the paper session that this paper will be in at Kalamazoo uh, on academia.edu, and this is, the, uh, this is the reply I got from uh, one, a HEMA researcher named Jeffrey Hull, you can read it for yourself. This is going to be an exercise in politically correct European self-hatred, precisely at the time anything European in the university museum entertainment complex is becoming less mainstream and more marginalized, which is why the non-university affiliated people would rather be free to their own thing via e.g. venues like e academia.edu. Well, I do not apologize for who I was born, nor for passion, pursuit of inherently ethnically European endeavor, i.e. chivalric arts, a.k.a. the so-called HEMA, no use of language. The presumptuous political diversity aspects of the description are so wanton as, as if an Enoch Powell fearing critical theory worshipping apparatchnik of the European Union wrote it. And he tells British people. Are you people serious about that? Really, quite frankly, it was utter garbage. Well, I guess why I shall never be invited to attend the International Medieval Conference. I am very sorry to tell you that, Mr. KM, notice the lack of, notice the honorific. Uh, but I find it quite disheartening. So, this is, you know, the, so there's, there's this, this, this downright hostility, right? To, to uh, so, and personally, you know, I'm in the middle, because the academy says, you know, you're useless, and then you're useless, get, you know, get out, and then I have these guys saying, you're, you're the enemy, right? So it's really, you know, just being, you know, just doing my own thing and being extremely punk rock, I suppose. Um, so we can draw parallels with these guys, though, to um, the, the Civil War reenactment. Like I said before, Peter Carmichael. Um, in 2013, Peter Mark Carmichael, he was at Gettysburg College, uh, historian of the Civil War, said um, that reenactments are an unfortunate distraction from a deep understanding of the Civil War. And then the article goes on to paraphrase when God knows what he actually said, because reporters like to paraphrase things to make them seem like they want to say. He says, it prefers living history and canvas to people like Old Musket or E. Hardtack giving them a tangible experience of the past, but best of all, of the National Park Service historians, all you need to do is stay in the National Park and come away with a very deep understanding of what happened here. So people dressing up like Confederates and playing at, playing at muskets is not cool. Uh, living history, you know, done in an accurate scholarly way is better, but best of all, talk to a professional historian, right? Someone who's been deputized by the academy. Um, Reenactment circles kind of blew up at this. They said this guy is an elitist. Um, and, you know, regardless of whether African American units are properly represented in battlefield reenactments or uh, white men under the age of 60 or uh, BMIs of 35 are properly represented, uh, battle reenactment is a spectacle, right? It engages the audience and it puts asses in seats. And that's, you know, what do we need to do in the history department, right? What, do, what, what does the administration here look at? What do they want? They want asses in seats. Asses in seats are the coin of the realm. So even though the stars and bars, you know, it's a, it's a polyvalent symbol, right? It's 
some places it's a uh, racial regime, in the other place it's a piece of pirate heritage. But this is something that no matter how you interpret this, just like with medieval history, you need to gloss it and interpret it, but if you try to suppress it, it's going to bite you in the ass. So, the desire to gloss these practices is kind of what this paper is about. So, looking at these sort of discourses in Hema, there are a couple of, a couple of discourses, right? There's what I'll call the enlightened embracing positivists, and then also the more reactionary identitist politics that go all the way from reactionary all the way into the actual neo-fascism. Um, and there's a long, long history. This is a quote from Edgerton Castle, um, who uh, was, these nine, the people who wrote about this, and up until Sidney Angle's one month, there's like one academic monograph on this stuff by uh, Sidney Angle, um, wrote in 2001, and <coughs> Up to that, we had basically these Victorian historians who had this total positive historian, historical view on it, right? History is a march towards perfection of the late 19th century bourgeois nation state. Just as uh, Northern Europe was superior to Southern Europe, people in colonized lands were more primitive than Europeans, and Jacob Burkhardt saw Italian despots as the forerunners of French autocrats. The European Middle Ages were a dark age that would inevitably seed to the Enlightenment. Right? The rough and tutored fighting in the Middle Ages represented the reign of brute force in, you know, in uh, social life as well as in politics, yada, yada, yada. Right? This is you know, eminently untrue, but the 26-year-old castle you know, was clearly picking up on the zeitgeist. So here's a little chart I made of some dichotomies. Right? The Middle Ages become, in a word, imperialized. They're a primitive time from which modernity emerges. Other cultures are stuck in the past, which is making them apt for, uh, for political, cultural, and political hegemony. And so the past, the past is also a colonizable mind space, right? But this gets taken forward into the future, where the past is seen, that is the medieval past, is seen as something that's potent, free from the constraints of modernity, and manly. And so I've got these, this bunch of binaries here that I came up with just to kind of characterize the discourse, right? Medieval is earlier, Renaissance, you know, moder or moder modernity, right? Later, heavier versus lighter, right? The heavier weapon is the better weapon, it's the real weapon. The lighter weapon isn't the real weapon. Um, it's strong, right? Whereas the other is weak, effete, right? Robust, fragile, during yielding, combative versus sportive, the sort of discourse of degeneration we see, manly versus effeminate free versus constrained, and authentic versus artificial. So these are, you know, these, these dichotomies, I think, are really, really present in pop culture. One reason why the imagined Middle Ages is such, um, such an escape from what people see in the decadent modernity, but also it gets taken over into this sort of amateur study of these fighting arts. Uh, and it's been used for all sorts of things. Like this is from a Hitler Youth app. Um, Hitler Youth, uh, Hitler Youth, right? Um, so the Volkskulturists, people, that's another thing too, this idea that fighting arts are somehow cognate with national character. Uh, Richard Francis Burton, um, the, that you know, the great explorer slash propagandist slash pornographer slash whatever you want to say, say you know, has this, uh, you know, it's implicit in his, um, in his writing, uh, especially his writing on swordsmanship too. Uh, the Hitler Youth had this, you know, this long sword fighting as a volkish pastime for the, for the Aryan youth. Um, and you know, never mind that some of the German fencing masters in the 15th century were documented like Jewish. Um, and things like that, right? Uh, Adam Brun Hofmeier was a mid 20th century scholar of uh, weapons and stuff in her 1963 essay from the Medieval Swords and Renaissance Rapier. Um, the swords of different peoples are, you know, are characterized by their national character and their way of fighting. So Latins, Germans, Orientals, etc., right? And they have different character features uh, because of this, right? So, you know, they don't look at cultural diffusion that must have taken place as it did in places like Sicily or the French, you know, the Queen of the II or in the Holy Land, but rather, you know, everything is along racialist lines. Um, that's out of Hoffmeyer there. Um, another, so another thing is that it's easy to rank one culture with another. This is John Clements. He is unfortunately more responsible than any other individual for the rise of this stuff because he was 
a big internet loudmouth who published a series of horrifically bad books on, uh, on the stuff. But he was a big propagandist, and he kind of led this thing called uh, Arma or Hacka, which is still around, but kind of led it like a cult. And he got a lot of people interested and involved with this as a big organization, right? So he was one big, big you know, figure in popularizing, so he also spread a lot of um, historical inaccuracies. Um, and one way he did this is he played policies of difference. Um, attacked Asian traditions, right, since the beginning of his uh, career. Um, and if you uh, talk to the guy, you know, he, he will, if you ever meet the guy, I met him at a conference in Glasgow a couple of years ago, and basically, you know, sit with the guy over here, and everything he says is that, well, these, you know, these Asians, you know, these Asians say that we don't have meditation, but meditation is a Latin word, right, meditatio, and, uh, you know, that we, have, we did it first and better, and these Asians are, just, you know, we're better than these Asian martial arts, right? It's a complete strategy of difference. We can document the longer, blah, 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 blah. So this is something that's unfortunate. Um, and, you know, there's also something, I guess, inherently chauvinistic to it, much as uh, was observed video games, right? I mean, English, Terry Brown, who is not, to my, to, to my knowledge, it doesn't have um, a racist bone in his body, right? Published a book called English Martial Arts, based on English sources of fencing, right? And, you know, that's his website, Terry Brown English School of Martial Arts, right? To my knowledge, he is not in any way a, uh, in any way a, uh, uh, you know, racist or against immigration or anything, but there's something inherent in um, the title of what he's doing. Okay, see something. Um, and he's, you know, steady come through for many, many years. But he is, uh, but this, this is things for English people, right? This is an English heritage kind of thing. So in a sense, it's inherently exclusive. It can't help but be by the nature of the thing. I certainly wouldn't attack him for it. Um, but you can see how it can be perhaps, you know, misused. Um, another guy um, who, you know, he's actually married to a Japanese woman as far as I know, doesn't have, you know, a racist bone in his body, mm -hmm. but his name is Ivar uh, Haskold, and he has this runic martial arts thing, which to all indications is actually based on Japanese martial arts. Um, but he calls, he says, this is, you know, stop, this is runic, you know, uh, martial arts, right? Uh, but it's actually based in Germanic occultism and um, other things. But, you know, he talks more about, uh, he, you know, he, he, he kind of presents his, his thing as rooted in the mists of time and European heritage, right? And so the implications of, you know, who, who would this appeal to, right? Who's his market? Well, a lot of people are interested, you know, especially in time of increasing immigration in Europe, with this idea of European heritage, authentic European culture. And it can be, I guess, a little troubling. Um, though, of course, you know, also South Asian martial arts are, are enjoying a bit of a revival in the UK when they study got to go to seek martial arts and places to do that as well. So, so you know, the, the thing is is that you, we do need some sort of litmus test then. That um, a Celtic cross, for instance, is a polyvalent symbol because it can be a racist symbol, but it's also, you know, you could say, you know, I'm Irish. Um, so some, some litmus tests, right? Culture is linked to race, something passed down with blood. It's exclusionary. The practices, objects, and other things related to one culture are only for and exclusively for that culture. Um, there's a rhetoric we often find in these things of a culture of practice being threatened and needing to be saved, and um, there's a deep distrust of the Enlightenment product and the modernity. So this is a bit of, of really the litmus test there, and you can see how historical European martial arts kind of plays into it. Um, so let's look at some people who maybe may or may not fail the litmus test. One is a guy I know, Andrew Zanar, who is a very very nice guy. But he, uh, and there's his young son um, reading, um, uh, reading um, uh, Ragnar Redbeard, who is, or not playing with Ragnar Redbeard, who is a 19th century and quite racialist writer and quite, quite off the, uh, off the charts there, right? Um, and he, you can read his blog for yourself, Constellation of Philosophy, uh, uh, Constellation of Beauty, I'm sorry, Constellation of Beauty. And, he, uh, oh, Jack Donovan, I'm sorry, wait a minute for Jack Donovan, my bad, sorry. Not Ragnar Redbeard, he likes Ragnar Redbeard too. 
Um, and he, you know, is unapologetically and holds forth and apart all the right things. You can read it for yourself. Um, he argues uh, quite eloquently and quite logically that, well, the, the Swedish welfare state is being endangered by the influx of foreigners who don't share Swedish cultural values. And he does have a point, because that is one thing that enabled you know, Sweden to become the Sweden that we American liberals love to hold up as a shiny example of, you know, of, of the social welfare state. Um, uh, furthermore, he argues that the Enlightenment project of tolerance and democracy has failed, right? And the answer is a sort of postmodern revival of past values. And his HEMA practice is, of course, incorporated in uh, <coughs> to this, this world view. Um, but of course, he doesn't, you know, say that assimilation, you know, that this is somehow genetically based, or that assimilation is impossible. He's just saying that there's a problem here, and there's a problem that we're tolerating other cultures who come here and don't respect our culture and our way of life. And it's, you know, the difficulty is that it is hard to argue with that in many cases that there are failings of liberalism. Um, another ambiguous, you know, there's also ambiguous, uh, I'll say ambiguous. Um, Dog whistles, for instance, um, there's a school in Vancouver called Blood and Iron. Uh, that's their logo with a Tottenkopf on it, which is a bit of a, you know, it's a bit of a dog whistle. Though they have never said or done anything explicitly uh, reactionary. Though I do believe they were against the transgender women fighting in the women's tournament. Um, and there's a bunch of other things that go, goes on there. There's a bunch of rumors surrounding them, but since it's an academic paper, I would give, uh, I wouldn't say <coughs> documented. Here's something, uh, I picked this up off the internet, don't know whose it was, but this is um, someone that's a messer. It's a uh, sort of a German machete-like weapon um, on a, uh, a HEMA fencing jacket. And they've uh, blocked out, whoever has put that up, blocked out the school patch and the name. And, but the, the patch you can see there is the, um, the uh, uh, Toltenwolf, which is the symbol of Operation Werewolf, which if you read the Operation Werewolf uh, website, it's Half Fight Club. Uh, it's, it's based off, uh, um, it's based off of um, the, of course, the Toltenkopf, but it's, they're basically a neo-fascist group um, that engages in um, manliness training, if you would. Um, reaction against um, uh, modernity, right? So this person apparently identifies with this human practice as part of Operation Werewolf, uh, more in Operation Werewolf, if you look on their website, or at the Southern Poverty Law Center. Uh, another person, Nicholas Bergeron, right? He's, uh, uh, his, he calls his, uh, Cuba, his um, open tournament in uh, Montreal, Might is Right, um, which is after a right now read your uh, book. Uh, and the uh, white supremacist and social Darwinist, who Ragnar Redbeard was, uh, he's Quebecois. Um, of course, says you know uh, when the fascists disguise themselves as, as Vikings, and he is um, somewhat unapologetically on the alt right. Uh, another fellow we can name is uh, I don't know where, who who that is, but another fellow we can name is um, uh, is. Uh, Frank Doherty, right? It's Frank Doherty, who uh, is an instructor in the UK. Um, people have used different symbols, right? Uh, this is uh, something Frank Doherty has said, right? Night attacks in central London by Islamists, or from Waltham Abbey by Islamists. We better start fighting back and soon, otherwise, we'll end up like Germany and Sweden. Um, you know, it is a coming waste law of war, uh, something else that Frank has posted on the Facebooks. You know, so uh, uh, you know, so uh, another uh, example that um, someone in 2016, about a year ago, there was a discussion on Facebook about um, uh, African martial arts, um, and someone uh, who called himself Sean Leonidas Sunderland, who's um, who's um, profile picture was the black sun symbol and the neo-Nazi symbol, um, basically said, in, initiated a race-based critique of this practice. Um, so basically, people are using HEMA in the same way, this idea of European heritage, in the same way that if you know anything about Astaru or neo-paganism, this is something that appeals to people who have this idea that, well, our European heritage is under attack, right? That we need to do something, right? Um, 
here's a, there are many, many, many posts on Stormfront. Um, Stormfront, you know, you know Stormfront, the white nationalist website. Um, many, many posts on Stormfront. Um, and then you quick post, there's a lot of people on Stormfront who are into this. So going to the other direction, right? Uh, who are interested in this. Um, other people are, you know, warning, warning about this stuff, right? Um, Else we got. Um, here's just outside of him or anything else, just incorporating a medieval armored weapons industry. Uh, this is the traditional worker, uh, tra traditionalist workers' party. Um, they their protest at Sacramento in Sacramento um, in last year, June of last year, um, sparked a riot, which they were attacked by left-wing anti-fascist street fighting type people. But you can see here they're carrying shields there. Source to go with them, but they've got a bunch, they bring with them a bunch of shields, um, is you know on their marches and things like that with their with their symbols, right? Um, and of course, I've come under personal attack for <coughs> researching and talking about this, right? After I posted something, say, hey, you know, you know, uh, I was um, looking to get these um, examples. Of, of things like we have examples of racism in HEMA, you know, please send it to me. This guy posts, social just war justice warrior academics like Ken are forever looking for racism, even if there's no evidence to suggest its existence. It's not just any racism that concerns them. A prominent point is anything conceivably done by whites against non whites. Even outward expressions of ethnic white pride are deemed by them to be offensive. If HEMA is indeed an organization for everyone, it must stop this endless race baiting of whites and still be returned to addressing and promoting a sport rich in European history. So there's no evidence to suggest racism in HEMA. Thank you for supplying me with the evidence, Tom, um, that you know, your complete lack of understanding of context or dominant culture or anything like this. The white people are under attack, right? That's you know part of the discourse of litmus test, right? Uh, this beautiful martial art, which we all love so dearly, can conceivably have a great future if the yoke of anti-white racism can be lifted from it. This imaginary yoke of anti-white racism that we see, you know, everywhere, all this anti-white white racism that we see, you know, dominating the discourse, the everywhere, you know, white people being shot down by the, by the police left and right, and all these things happen. It's a good thing we've got, you know, that white lives matter movement. So, uh, you know, I know a fellow who's told me this privately, so I didn't put it on the screen, but he's, uh, he does research into Middle Eastern martial arts. He himself is of uh, a Middle Eastern ethnicity. And he says, I have never seen so many racists as in Hema. He lives in Europe, by the way. Austrians being the worst. The Germans are pretty good because they've been all educated this post Holocaust. But the problem is that it brings out a lot, you know, attracts a lot of bad people, right? It gives a social network that perhaps, you know, uh, fellow sympathizers who are sympathetic to your, to your dog whistles. And uh, there's a bunch of people who haven't been properly educated, really, in what they're, you know, in the implications of what they're saying, right? This idea of anti white racism and things like that. Um, so, you know, it's, you know, ethnocentrism is one fallout. Another, of course, it plays in the people who are interested in the history of uh, weapons ownership. I'm not going to go too much into that. Of course, there's also. You know, there's a lot, there are a lot of um, people in this, I would say the vast majority of people in this, who are not just not racist, but who are anti-racist, um, who, you know, are interested in and in research, uh, research into Middle Eastern and uh, African and Asian martial arts. Uh, the Fighters Against Racism group is uh, pretty popular. Um, but of course, you know, the problem is, is not just that, but the fact that we have, you know, we come up with these with these troops, right? We come up with this. We, we do our research. We do these things, and we come up. We, we find information and data, right? We we find these things, but it's the way in which these things can be deployed, and the context in which these things that can be deployed, and that's what we have to be be careful for, and that's why careful academic study, weighing all the context, and also. You know, presenting from the right point of view. I opened my paper on the history of the Italian school saying, well, actually, if you look at this, they, you know, the, with, I used the word diversity in the first sentence. My whole thing is that there's actually a diversity of 
things within the history of Italian fencing instead of this one national resistance school. And obviously, when I write things, I write things from the perspective of a modern academic. Of course, I receive zero support for what I do, so what, how long I'm going to be able to do it is debatable, which means that, of course, if people like me don't get support for doing this, then who's going to win? The guy is saying, you know, we must recover our great white history, which is under threat. Because then they dominate the discourse, because then there's no one providing an authoritative counter discourse. Um, uh, so the, everything really needs to be subjected to formal academic study. If that doesn't happen, right, it will not just sabotage the legitimacy of human research in general, because it will come to be, you know, much like Confederate reenactment, identified with racism, but it'll also jeopardize, further jeopardize the academic study of the Middle Ages in general, because, you know, mid research into the Middle Ages will be increasingly more and more identified with this sort of right-wing identity-seeking nationalism. And that's why it's more important, uh, more important than ever to fund, you know, medieval, you know, medieval positions. Um, the audience for neither Civil War battle reenactments nor for medieval sword fighting is going to go away. It's here. It's going to stay, right? And unless, like they do with the Civil War, we have academic historians contending with this, we're going to lose control of the discourse and, you know, lose, you know, and we're going to become irrelevant. And, you know, in this age of neoliberal management of the academy, where asses and seats are important, then that is the first and foremost thing. And that's it. So, let me set the camera. Do right, you want to do questions on the camera? Do you guys have questions? Well, just more of a comment. No, that was, really, that was really interesting. I mean, it's amazing that there's so much popular interest, and yet, as you say, it's not that popular interest isn't matched in academia. And there's no one fact checking or interpretation checking, you know? It's more yeah. true, yeah. yeah. No one's saying, no, that's not a reasonable argument, and you don't have good evidence. Mm -hmm. You know, which is all we are at, really. Being, a, being a, an academic, that's what you're saying. Is it a reasonable argument? And where is your evidence? Is it reliable? Is it verifiable? You know, um, yeah. Truth, you know, increasingly in a post-truth era, and an era in which we don't think it's any coincidence that the post-truth era has taken place, you know, after we've got, you know, the first generations graduating college, um, after No Child Left Behind, right? That this is, this is what's, you know, what's going on in America. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, young, yeah. but, you know, I feel very much like me scribbling away in the monastery here. Mm -hmm. Perhaps, you know, more punk rock feed, but you know, whatever. Um, and ultimate, ultimately, though, I mean, ultimately, though, I mean, I do my work, I rationalize it, I do my work, and I do this work that I care very deeply and passionately about, I, you know, at great, tremendous personal expense, right, both physical, time, emotional, energy. Um, I do this because I'm passionate about it, and I write for, for the audience, and I don't know who my audience is. My audience maybe, you know, the 20 people out there on the internet who read my stuff, my audience may be someone in a research library, you know, 100 years from now, after I'm long dead, right? Someone may be pulling this video up on YouTube, you know, Lord knows, or the success of YouTube or some format, hopefully everything will be, you know, forward compatible, but they're pulling this stuff up, you know, hundreds of years in the future, um, some artificial intelligent algorithms say, hey, maybe you're, in, you're interested in, in this, and they'll pull this up and they'll see what I'm saying now, and this will be like someplace in some argument somebody makes sometime in the future, right? But I'm just, I, I feel like it's important stuff to do. It's just my little cry against the entropy of, of existence, so. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I think, I mean, especially given like right now, you know, like you say, with this, this job market and finding a full-time position, contract or, or tender track, but it, even, um, yeah, you're doing this on your own dime. 
yeah. you know, and and um, it would be better if you had a full time position, contract or tenure track. But even in some colleges, I won't say which colleges, in you know, if you're full time or tenure track or tenure, in effect, you can end up doing research or professional activities on your own time and dime as well. Yeah. Um, but at least you have the full time position. Yeah. At least you have. Yeah.